Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to High Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus Christ of Nazareth is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible, hallelujah, is our only standard and authority for truth. And how grateful we should be to the living God for preserving His Word for us in this day throughout time. Now we're continuing our study in the book of Romans, and today we're in chapter 14. Now chapter 14 just reiterates what Paul says through all of his letters, because Paul being a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Jew of Jews, a man who has been trained in the theological aspects of the Old Testament, it is said by many that Paul memorize the first five books of the Bible, and there are those who believe he actually memorized the entire Old Testament. Whether that be true or not, we know that he trained under Gamaliel, and Gamaliel was the head teacher in all of Israel. And the prerequisites to train under Gamaliel were so high that it was only reserved for the few. And yet Paul is one of those few. And so Paul was very educated when it came to the biblical teachings, the Old Testament teaching of the early Jewish people. And that being true, Paul was well confined to live within the law. Matter of fact, he says of himself that he adhered to the law better than all of his compatriots, all of those who were training with him, even his teachers and other Pharisees and Sadducees. And so Paul understands in now becoming a believer in the Lord Jesus and not abiding by the letter of the law, but abiding by the spirit of the law, not regarding the law itself, but standing in the grace that the Lord Jesus offers. He understands the difficulty that arises when we try to differentiate between the two. And even us as Gentiles, not being raised in the Jewish faith, not being accustomed to living under such bondage of the law, even we have a hard time discerning between which side we stand on. Do we either stand on the side of the law and the law only, or do we stand on the side of grace and grace only? And what Paul is trying to do is he's trying to get us to stand in the middle with one foot on both sides. Yes, we abide by the law, but we stand in grace. And that's so hard for us to get our minds around. And so Paul begins chapter 14 with that very thought in mind because he's speaking of those who are weaker in the faith, who still feel bound by such acts of law. And then he's speaking to those who are stronger in the faith and those who realize that they don't have to carry the burden of the law. And so Paul begins in verse 1 by simply stating, Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful dispensations. In other words, we're not to argue with them. Because what we have to understand is each man has to come to obedience to the truth on his own. Because if we don't, we're only falling into religion and religious practices. And God doesn't want us to do things for him because they're mandated unto us. That's the law. God wants us to cheerfully give of ourselves, not only our money, but everything that we have. And so as we grow in obedience and as we receive the purifying, sanctifying power of the Lord in our lives, it will cause us, he, the Holy Spirit, will cause us to place our lives before the light of the Lord. And as we examine ourselves and we realize things that we don't approve of because we know that God doesn't approve of them, every man is to work out his own salvation with fear and trembling. And so that's what we do. As we grow in the knowledge of the Lord, in our relationship with the Lord, and our understanding of the Lord, the process will be less of me, more of him. And every day, that's our goal. Less of me, more of him. 
And so when we've conquered one thing in our lives and we've gotten that behind us, it seems like we now see something new that we didn't see before that needs correction and we bring that unto the Lord till eventually we look back at our old life, our childhood stages of our spiritual growth and we don't even recognize that person anymore because there have been so many consistent changes day by day throughout the weeks, the months and the years that we don't even recognize the person that we once was. And so again, Paul says, Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believes he may eat all things. That would be the stronger brother. That would be the stronger sister. But another who is weak only eats herbs. Well, let not him that eats all that is set before him despise him that does not eat all that is set before him. And let not him which eats not judge him that eats, for God has received him. In other words, each of us are walking in our own light. We're all walking in our own place where we are in our journeys. And we're all at different points in our journeys. And so even though we can learn from others, And even though we are to pass on to others what we have learned in our journey, we are never to look down upon them because we must realize that at one time we were once there. And this again is easier said than done. And this is where self-righteousness becomes an issue for us because we consider where we are in our journey to be different than that in others. And so in a small way, we think ourselves better than them. And while that may be true, if you stop and think about it, you are better because you've become more obedient unto the things of the Lord. The problem is, is that your focus is upon others, not upon you, not upon your journey. Even though you may have accomplished much in your journey, there is still so much more left to be done. And if you're focused upon your journey and what needs to be done in your life, you have very little time to look upon others and certainly to judge others. Now understand, we have a responsibility to hold others accountable who claim to be followers of the Lord Jesus and aren't obeying his commandments. But Jesus never commanded us to abstain from meats, to differentiate between certain days, Because he understands that each of us are going to work that out in our own particular journey with the Lord as we strive to be more obedient to him each and every day. And so Paul says, don't look down upon the weak. Help them, instruct them. But if they don't see the truth for themselves, leave them to God. And friends, this would be true whether we're talking about meat, whether we're talking about rock and roll, whether we're talking about country music, whether we're talking about sports, whether we're talking about pornography or drinking or smoking marijuana in those states where it's legal, each person has to determine what is right in their relationship before God. And again, we can instruct them in the ways of God, but we must leave them to the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Because if they only change for us, their change is not going to last very long. But if they change through a revelation from God, their change will be eternal. And this is where it becomes hard to proclaim the message of the truth, yet do it without being condescending to others. And that's what Paul is saying. He says, who are you to judge another man's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Now, as we read this passage, let's think of this as the master being Jesus. So who are you to judge another man's servant? Who are you to judge one who is serving the Lord Jesus? Because it is to the Lord Jesus that he stands or falls. And God is able to make him stand. Now, in the context, that's not what Paul is talking about, but it certainly applies. Each of us are seeking to follow the Lord Jesus and be obedient to the Lord Jesus. He is the true master. Each of us are the servant, and it is before him alone that we will give account individually for each of our lives. And that's why Paul says, let every man seek his own salvation with fear and trembling. 
because we will give account of our lives, of the choices that we made. Well, Paul continues in the line of thinking of what one is to eat and what is to not eat. He says, one man esteems one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Now, there are those that would tell you that this is speaking of the Sabbath or even other Jewish festival days, days that are to be set aside for the worship and praise of God. But this passage is sandwiched between two other verses that are speaking about what we are to eat. For example, look at verse 6. He that regards the day, now the question is what day are we talking about, regards it unto the Lord. And he regards not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eats, eats to the Lord. See, we're back to eating. Well, we were speaking about what we were to eat and what we're not supposed to eat. Then he talks about this day that is to be set aside. And then he goes back to talking about eating. And he says, the person that does so gives God thanks. And he that eats not to the Lord, he eats not and give God thanks. Now I say this because there are some who believe the day that it is talking about here isn't necessarily a holy day such as the Sabbath, but it's the day of the fast. But because the text isn't entirely clear, it's open to speculation. But in its context, it would appear to have something to do with eating. Because as I said, it's sandwiched between these two verses that are speaking about eating. So if the writer is writing within one train of thought, it would seem to have something to do with eating. Well, Paul continues in verse 8 and he says, whether we live or whether we die. We live unto the Lord, we die unto the Lord, for we are the Lord's. So why do you judge your brother? Why do you become self-righteous? Why do you look down upon others? Why do you speak condescending to others? We will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess individually. Each will give account for his own life. And so if we are encouraging others on what to eat, what not to eat, which we shouldn't do because the Bible gives no prohibition, or let me say the New Testament gives no prohibition. So to be more applicable to the things that we encounter today, when we speak about rock and roll, rated R movies, country music, the ungodly things that are available on the internet, video games, or any other thing that we would think practicing, holy pursuing Christians should not be involved in, the end of our conversation with others should simply be to remind them that they will give account for the choices that they've made. And they should consider that very carefully with fear and trembling, knowing that God is going to hold them accountable. So we don't leave them with the burden of feeling what we have said, but we leave them only in their personal relationship with God and that he demands higher acts of service from them. For every one of us in verse 12 shall give account of himself to God. So let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. So if you feel like it's okay to do something, but another brother feels like that is wrong, you shouldn't participate in whatever activity that is just to flaunt your freedom. For you are causing him pain and trouble. And if you truly loved him, you wouldn't treat him in such a manner. Now, Paul says in verse 14, I know and I am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to the one that esteems anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Why? Because that's where he is in his journey. That's where he is in his understanding of the Lord and what the Lord requires. And so for him, God has ruled upon this matter. And for you to entice him to think otherwise would be for him to be obeying man rather than God. And so he says, if your brother be grieved with your meat, then you are not walking in love before him because you are the one that is bringing that grief upon him. So don't destroy him with your meat, with your liberty, with your freedom, because Jesus died for him. And remember, 
in verse 17. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink anyway. It's not what you do or what you don't do. Now, friends, this is difficult to grasp, and I struggle with this myself. The kingdom of God is not what you do or what you don't do. Well, then why can't I do anything I want to do? Why can't I just live life to the fullest and suck it dry for everything that it has to offer? Well, simply put, because the Lord has warned us against such lifestyles. But Paul says the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. That isn't to be the priority. The priority isn't what we do and what we don't do. The priority is to bring pleasure to the Lord Jesus. That being the priority, falling under that priority, would be the things that we do and don't do. But if the priority is the things we do and don't do, then Jesus is left as second or third or fourth. And that's what Paul is trying to indicate here. He says the kingdom of God is righteousness. Righteousness is right standing before God. It's obedience to God. So it is important, but only in its right priority. The kingdom of God is peace. The kingdom of God is joy in the Holy Ghost. If you wake up each morning and you feel a burden in feeling like you are required to do and don't do certain things, there's no joy in that. Your obedience should bring you much joy in the Lord. So let us, in verse 19, follow after the things which make for peace, which make for righteousness, which make for joy in the Holy Ghost, and things wherewith one may edify another, where we build one another up. We encourage one another to be the best possible servants of the Lord Jesus that we can possibly be. And we do this in how we communicate the message. We're encouraging them, not speaking condescendingly to them. And there is a fine line that separates those two. For remember, all things are pure. Now notice what Paul says in verse 21, because it almost seems like he's contradicting himself. He says, it's good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine. But he's just said, all things are pure. All things are allowed, but not all things are edifying in our walk with God. And I think this is where we have a hard time because it's like, look, make up your mind. Either I can or I can't. Either I do or I don't. But I don't know how to be both. Especially early on in our Christian journeys, because we just want to be told what to do or what not to do. And we don't want to be left to figure it out for ourselves. But Paul is saying, I want you to figure it out for yourself. Because all things are lawful, but not all things are edifying. And that's where each of us have to go in our relationship before our God and ask, is this edifying in my relationship with you? Is this strengthening my relationship with you? Or is it weakening my relationship with you? Is it harming my relationship with you? Is it destructive to my relationship with you? And for many of the things that we would want to practice and do on a daily basis, we will find that they're destructive in our relationship with the Most High. And so they're not edifying. Now in verse 22, Paul says, Do you have faith? Well, have it to yourself before God. Don't flaunt it before others. Be very sensitive to how your actions, what you do and don't do, not only appears before others, but how it affects others around you. For happy is the man that does not condemn himself in the thing which he allowed. If you allow yourself to do something, but then you're constantly beating yourself up, your conscience is constantly attacking you, well, you're not going to be a happy man. Why? Because whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And so Paul says, look, if you can honestly say within your heart that there is no inner voice telling you to not do or to do, then for you there is nothing to fear before God. But if there is a quiet inner voice that is speaking to you that you should stop doing whatever that is or start doing whatever that is, then if you don't listen to that inner voice, you are in disobedience and rebellion unto God. 
because that is God speaking to you through your conscience. And therefore, whatever it is you're doing or you're not doing is not of faith. And because it is not of faith, it is sin. And where sin is in your life, there is much cause for fear and trembling in your relationship with the Lord, knowing that one day you will stand before the Lord, you will give account for your life, and where that inner voice was so quiet in speaking to you at one time, now it will speak very loudly and clearly as it reveals the truth of your disobedience before the Lord Jesus as you stand and give account for your life. Well, friends, I know that that is a whole lot to think about today from this chapter, and I hope that I'm not leaving you more confused than when you began this study. And I, like you, wrestle with this idea that all things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial. And I think in matters such as thee, we have to refer back to the book of Proverbs when it says, do not lean to your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge God. Or we could say, let everything you do, everything you say, everything you think, bring glory to God and honor to Jesus, his son. And if it does not, then it should not be a product of our lives. Well, I love you, friends. I'm so grateful again. I'm honored and blessed that you're with us this morning. It thrills my heart that you are taking time out of your day to enjoy the Word of God, be instructed through the Word of God, be corrected through the Word of God, so that you and I, each and every day, can become a little bit more like Jesus and a little bit less than ourselves. That we can learn what it is He wants of us, He desires of us, and he truly created us to be. Oh, friends, I pray that the Holy Spirit will speak truth into your life today. And what I am unable to communicate through the frailty of these lips, may he enlighten your soul and bring you to the truth of his word so that when you stand before him on that great day, you can stand faithful and confident knowing that you have done everything in your power to be obedient as you possibly can. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video.